Hello, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us on what looks like a very hot and sunny afternoon to hear from Rua Life Sciences, who um, announced their preliminary results um, at the beginning of the week to the uh, year end of March. Um, we are here today with Bill Brown, Executive Chairman, uh, David Richmond, who is the a Group CEO of Rua Life Sciences, and Caroline Stretton, Chief Operating Officer of Rua. Um, I believe David and Caroline are here for questions at the end, but in the meantime, I will hand over to Bill, who will take you through the presentation. That's great. Thank, thank, thank you very much for, uh, for organising it, and I'll uh, try and not spend too long going through uh, the presentation, because I'm sure a lot of people will be wanting to get back to, to watching the golf that's on just now. Um, so just the agenda that I'd like to run through uh, today is a brief overview on the company, the financial results for the uh, for the year ended March, um, some updates on the environmental, social, and governance issues, which uh, are becoming much more important, uh, and then some detail on the group businesses, uh, but with a particular focus on Rua Vascular, which is the uh, the, the main short term dri uh, value driver within the group. Um, so moving on, the, the overview of the company. The company is all about the elastion material. It's becoming much more important because of the uh, looking to use the material to eliminate a uh, abattoir sourced animal byproducts, as say our sales and marketing director John McKenna likes to call it. So the business is now in a commercialization phase after a, 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 a good deal of uh, research and development work. So the development's been done, the testing is just about completed and the uh, you know, applications for regulatory approval will be going in for the main product, the large bore vascular grafts in the, you know, in the, in, in, in hopefully the not too distant future. So we're a cardiovascular medical device company using the properties of Elastion to uh, build some, 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 some really exciting, uh, some really exciting products. Um, we're fortunate in being a, in the position that we have got two fairly mature businesses within the group already, and that's the Rua Medical Business Subcontract Manufacturer and the Polymer Licensing Business that came from a, the old Aortic. Um, the Elastion material itself it is the technology platform a, for, the, for, the, for the business, and we believe that the, 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 the incidence of COVID is certainly making regulated, regulators look at a what is termed as biogenic material and I think we're in a great position just now to a exploit the, the the opportunities in that um we're as we say we're moving well towards commercialization now um and the you know we're looking to put say put deals in place with distributors and and, and and some major corporations so that's a brief brief overview I'm going to move on to the the uh, the financial highlights um, so for the, the year just finished, it's difficult to compare with the previous period because at the start of the year, uh, we made the acquisition of the Rua Medical uh, business. Um, Rua Medical was impacted by COVID. We probably dropped 400,000 or thereabouts in revenues because of the impact on a non-elective on the elective surgery. Um, but the biomaterials business actually performed better than we'd expect and actually ahead of the uh, the indications we give to the market back in May, and that was down to one of the uh, one of the licensees having a, a bumper first quarter, uh, which we hadn't uh, fully fully estimated. Um, great gross profit margin, eighty two percent, and you know that that's you know that's that's a level that we can you know probably see growing as the uh, as as the volume increases through the business. Um, admin expenses were quite well up in the previous year, partly due to the acquisition of Rua Medical but also due to planned expenditure a, that was a, put in place for the, for the R&D projects. And particularly within that, a, there was a broadly £300,000 increase in R&D. So next year, we should benefit from that by further cash back from the, uh, the R&D tax credit scheme. Um, but we finished the year with a 6.3 million in cash. So the, the, the cash position was, was healthy and gives us the funds to move the company a, forward or to meet the ambitious the targets we've got. Um, so what have we actually achieved in the last 12 months? It's, it's, it's been actually quite remarkable in my, you know, my view. We concluded the acquisition of Rua Medical, got that uh, all, all bedded in. Um, we filled the tank 
in capital with a successful seven million fundraising back in December. We managed COVID or the, the, the Rua medical business in particular has managed COVID very well. Um, we've strengthened the board. Caroline joined us in January and we in a brought further strength into the non-executive area of the board with the appointment of Ian Ardell, uh, who's, who, who's now chairing the, the audit committee. Um, we've invested during the last 12 months just over one and a quarter million in property and equipment. The sharp eyed amongst you that are a, have been looking at and analysing the accounts will see that, that number is different from what's displayed in the account, but I'll explain shortly where, where that, uh, that difference is. Um, great progress was made in the R&D uh, projects, and I, th I, th I think we now have a product rather than a project, uh, and we're looking to bring that to market during the course of the remainder of this financial year. And last but not least, uh, the company name was changed, and we've undergone a rebranding exercise, as you can see with the, the Rural Life Sciences logo on, these, uh, on this presentation pack. So moving on to what say uh, the accountants want us to call consolidated income statements. Say uh, the dinosaurs like myself still refer to this as a profit and loss account. Um, the biomaterials revenue in sterling terms was up four uh, percent to five hundred and seven thousand within the, the the total revenue figure there. But uh, in the invoice currency, we do invoice all of the the biomaterials license fees and royalties in U.S. dollars. It showed twelve percent like for like growth. Um, Rua was hit, as I said earlier, by COVID. We estimate that the impact on lost sales from that are about £400,000. Um, we've benefited from some other income, which includes a grant finance for some of the projects being worked on, uh, 150000 of COVID a grant support through Scottish Enterprise, and the other income line also includes a, the furlough receipts for when we did have some staff in on furlough during the course of last summer, but we got everybody back as quickly as we could uh, to make sure that the R&D projects were being, were being pushed forward. Um, gross margin, a uh, lying at 82%. Um, that's probably not far from the run rate that we would expect from the rural medical business, but with the lower volumes that that, that, that was impacted, and it, it, that side of the business was down at about 73%. But the biomaterials uh, revenues is all at pretty much 100% gross margin. So took it took it up to that 80 uh, 80 percent level. Um, all of our R and D expenditure is charged to the P and L account, um, and the charge for the parent company in the full year was say uh, over half a million pounds, five hundred and forty one thousand, which is an increase of three hundred over the uh, over the previous year, and that was pretty much all additional spend on the vascular graft project uh, to take it from the design phase through all the development and testing. Um, we had within a, the admin expenses, there was a transactional cost related to the acquisition of Rua and some of the costs that couldn't be charged the, the, uh, the, 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 the share premium account in relation to the uh, share issue that was conducted in December. Um, Non-cash costs, which are amortization and share-based payments. Uh, it was 272 in amortization, share-based payments are 128. Uh, which brings the, the operating loss for the year to uh, just over one and a half million. The balance sheet, if we just move on to the next slide, um, there's a, a, a quite a, an uplift in a intangibles on the balance sheet now. That's partly down to the goodwill and the acquisition of Rua Medical and the intangibles that were created on, on, on consolidation. Um, there was 837,000 invested in new fixed assets uh, included in the, in, in, within the rural medical business. Um, but within receivables, which are further down the balance sheet there, th that includes uh, over, it was just over 400,000 in prepaid capex. So money that we had expended um, for equipment that was about to be delivered or had been delivered but hadn't been uh, hadn't been fully installed so that takes the the, the uh, investment in fixed assets during the last 12 months to the one and a quarter million that, uh, that we mentioned uh, non-current liabilities include equipment leases of 124,000 deferred tax which we're hoping to have to pay of 163 and there's some bank borrowings there which related to a the property acquisition within the room when we bought an additional property is, is, is funded through bank debt. 
Current liabilities included the deferred consideration on the acquisition of Rua, which is say 425. But we finished the year with a, a, a strong cash balance of six six point three million, um, and you know that's providing the cash to enable us to further further develop the the, the company and invest in the, uh, the the assets required to commercialise the the uh, the graph project in particular. Um, just moving on to Rua Medical, uh, if I can cover. You know what we what we paid and what we bought a uh, in, in in this slide. The headline a uh, price was two point four five million, um, but in it's reflected in the accounts at a uh, two million and forty one thousand. Uh, that's due to the one and a half million shares that were issued uh, to David on acquisition, uh, being valued at the fair value uh, for accounting treatment, which was the trading price, probably the trading price at the time that the acquisition was done. Um, the deferred consideration has now all been repaid, um, so there's effectively 950,000 of, uh, of, of cash. Um, what we acquired and, and, and why it was strategically important is the Rua, Medi Rua Medical is a, an end-to-end -end developer a, and manufacturer of medical devices. So it brought everything that the group required to be able to conclude the R&D work and move into full-blown production and commercialization of, of the of the vascular grafts. Um, we're based in Scotland. There's currently two facilities. There will shortly be three facilities, uh, one in Presswick and uh, there will be two in, in Irvine. And the two facilities are registered with the, with the FDA and have had their ISO accreditation uh, extended in that. So you know, it's got clean room capacity um, which is currently about 25% utilised, um, but with the a ramp up in production of the, um, the grafts and patches over the course of the next 12 months, we believe we will be filling that fairly rapidly. Um, this headcount within the business has grown from, a, I think, about 24, 25 at the point of acquisition. A, there's now 32 people within Rua Medical, so we have been investing in people as well as uh, capital and equipment. Um, moving on to environmental, social and governance. Um, it, the first time that we're really making, making a, uh, you know, highlighting what we've been doing in this, but what the, the Rua Medical uh, business very much based on a lot of the, the, the hard work that Caroline has been doing in that area over the course of the last couple of years, is doing some fabulous things within a both environmental and, a, and social. Um, we're looking to reduce a you know, energy consumption as much as possible and have that as green as possible. So we've been working on a kind of grant-based schemes to, uh, to make us as, as efficient as possible. We are already a, a zero waste company. Uh, and we've got the business aligned with the UN 2030 sustain, uh, sustainable development uh, objectives. Um, and the target over the next year or, or, or during during next year is to get the company accredited as ISO 14001, uh, which is the uh, envi environmental standard. Um, a full gap analysis has been done and we feel pretty confident that that whole ISO standard can be incorporated into the current quality management system. Um, in relation to kind of socialism, you know, particularly on, on, on how, we, how we're dealing with our staff and how we're dealing with our customers, we deal with the customers first. Um, we have a conducted customer satisfaction audits and, you know, we've had even during the difficult COVID period, you know, we've achieved a 95% customer satisfaction uh, rating. Customers have not been let down on deliveries and we've actually built the reputation of the company during that period by not letting the customers down and they've suffered they've suffered issues with other suppliers so I think that can create some some opportunities for us um the the staff within Ru have done quite an amazing job over the course of the last 12 months and what is a you know very difficult time a you know with the, with the global pandemic and I think that's all been down to uh, the way that Ru has looked after its staff engaged with staff, um, conducted, you know, satisfaction, like staff satisfaction audits, and and uh, you know, just recently moved into the, the full living wage accreditation. And there's a lot of development of staff. We've got the apprentices, graduate schemes running um, to help uh, help develop those. And it's been the investment in 
that HR looking after people, engaging with people properly, that enabled us to get so much out of the team uh, over the course of the tw last 12 months. They've all, they all rose to the task. Very demanding targets been set for them, but they were they were all achieved. Um, on the uh, the governance side, um, you know we've, we've 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 moved forward. I always view it as a as a journey, not a destination in itself. But the role of chairman and chief executive has been split. We brought new uh, blood onto the board, so Caroline joins us as, as, as chief operating officer, and Ian Ardell a uh, came in to, has come in to chair the audit committee. Ian has been a he met all the requirements that we were looking for in bringing somebody in financially qualified, the experience of uh, being a finance director in public companies, and you know, just as importantly, um, has got a huge amount of experience in the medical device sector. So he understands our business well. And it, I think a, a great credit to a to the team within Rua Medical that. You know, Ian's comment when we were going through the the, 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 the the full audit committee process was that most of the companies that he's been involved with has been trying to at least get onto the curve of a environmental, social and governance issues and feels that uh, Rua is actually quite well ahead of the curve. So, you know, well done to the team, uh, team in that. Um, moving on to our businesses, um, there's four companies and, and, and businesses within uh, the Rua Life Sciences Group, the Rua Biomaterials, which is the, the Elastion Licensor, Rua Medical, uh, the design and developer manufacturer, Rua Vascular, which will be the business that will be marketing the uh, large bore grafts and the, and the tissue patches, and Rua Structural Heart, which is developing the trileaflet heart valve. I'll touch on each of these companies very briefly, uh, but focus mostly on Rua Vascular towards the end, because that's where most of the development's been carried out. Um, so Rua Biomaterials, uh, it's, if, if you just move on one slide, that's perfect. Um, it is the company that's exploiting the Elastion materials. It is, in my opinion, the world's best long-term implantable polyurethane type material. Um, there's a, a, a number of different versions of Elastion available, which make it suitable for a inclusion of different manufacturing methods into, into a number of different devices. Um, but it's just got, you know, really, really good properties. The one that I think is, is, is particularly important is that long-term biostability. It doesn't break down in the body and in the areas that uh, we are focusing on in developing our own products. It's the non-thrombogenic nature of the material that is very, very important in, 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 in blood contacting and cardiovascular in particular. Um, it's been about for a long time. It's FDA master files on it. The material, you know, has 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 has, has not had any clinical issues. It's been clinically proven over uh, 15 years in use now. Rua Medical, a uh, which is the the engine room as we like to describe it, of the group, which is designing, developing, manufacturing devices. Great business runs at 75 to 80 percent gross margin working with a uh, global and multinational uh, customers and device companies. As I said earlier, we've got two FDA uh, registered facilities, multiple clean rooms covering uh, all of class six, seven and eight. And as the engine room of the, uh, the R&D work that's been done and the growth and production, we are recently recertified uh, in the ISO 13485, which is the standard that's required for medical device manufacture. And we added additional uh, services that can be uh, offered to customers uh, in that audit. So the scope of our uh, approvals have been increased. Um, we're always, I mean, one of, one of David's uh, views in the business that you always need to keep ahead of capacity so that you've got space to grow into rather than uh, trying to, uh, you know, cat, 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 catch up on demand. Um, we have recently signed heads of terms for the acquisition of the industrial unit, which is the mirror image of the our unit in Irvine, and we hope to be acquiring that and to starting to uh, build further further clean room facilities uh, and the uh, testing labs in in that building uh, towards the end of the year. And within room medical, as I said earlier, thirty two you know highly experienced members of staff, which has been growing nicely. Moving on to Rua Structural Heart, I'm not going to say an awful lot in this because it's, it's, I think we'll have more to say in more detail in a, in a few months' time. Um, 
a lot was achieved in the last 12 months. A, effectively, the proof of concept of the polymeric uh, leaflet valve was, was, was proven. We have been doing a lot of work on taking the manufacturing quality and standards up from what the first prototype was, uh, was like. And we have valves that have been manufactured that are now ready for testing. We've elected to take all the testing in-house rather than subcontract out to testing houses uh, because that will give us a much quicker turnaround time between uh, various design iterations. Um, we're due to see, uh, take possession of uh, the full range of testing equipment. It's due for delivery end of August, given combination of Brexit and COVID and whatever. I'm not say uh, you know I'm 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 not holding my breath that it will arrive on time because everything else that we've been looking to get delivered has suffered some 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 element of delay. But in a relatively short time, we will see uh, we'll see that test equipment come in. Um, the test equipment itself will be testing the hundred percent a polymeric leaflet, um, but we have also over the course of the last six months been working on an alternative to the polymeric leaflet valve to just see how that works. It's something that came out of the animal testing on the uh, vascular products uh, that we believe that a composite material of the combination of textile and elastion might a uh, you know take that that valve product uh, even even further forward and make it uh, even more attractive um, but we're not going to know uh, just how well that's worked until we undertake the testing on it so I'll just leave structural heart at, uh, at that um, so Rua vascular uh, see this it's the current focus and and the the, the, the short-term value driver um, the first range of products that will be launched are the large bore vascular grafts in the pictures there you can see one of the grafts which has been implanted in the in, in, the, in the, the sheep trial that we undertook and at the bottom is a picture of a a sing, uh, manufactured in one piece, a aortic root a graft, um, which is can either be attached a heart valve to a, carry out the bento procedure or can be implanted surgically for, uh, for the David procedure. Um, what we've got is we're using here is the, 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 the sealing properties of the last one material. Um, so it's like the, the biocompatible polymer, that biostable polymer. And we've got an improved a graft construction, which is based on Rua Medical's a implantable textiles expertise. We are moving into what is an old market. Um, I think there's 200,000 procedures carried out globally, uh, surgically in the large bore grafts, but the technology that's used in it is 40, 45 years old. Um, the basically the competing products are they're a bit like a sock, but they're dipped in gelatin or collagen to, to, to stop that sock leaking. And we've got you know, a much more modern version. A, some of the work that John McKenna has been looking at as far as the, the, the marketing and the opportunities a, for the graphs is that um, it is becoming much more important for hospitals to offer to a, their patients product that doesn't contain a animal byproduct for you know ethical religious reasons um, as well as the the, the the risk of species to species contamination and if there is an alternative available the uh, the patient should be uh, should be made aware of that so I think we could have <clears throat> quite an interesting disruptive uh, technology uh, with uh, with what we've been doing if we can just move on a little bit to the, so the benefits that, that we're looking at and what the potential hurdles might be to, to, to getting the, the, the graph taken up. Um, the, the graph performs pretty much exactly the same as, a, as, as, as graphs that are in the market just now. So it feels the same, you know, sutures the same. The sealant a, with the benefits of Elastion, you know, it's pretty much 100% sealed. The sealant itself is only in the external surface, and you can see on the uh, the, 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 the two microscopic uh, photographs. One is the outside of the graft, which is 100% say sealed with elastion, and on the inside, it's a uh, basically the raw fabric uh, into which the body uh, naturally grows into endothelial layer cells to make the the the, the, the graft perform a uh, more like the natural blood vessel. Um, so there's no blushing in it, a, no sign of blood, so it's 100% sealed. 
Um, we've got a, a, a as automated as we can get modern manufacturing a, a procedures put in place and they'll be fully validated to minimize the, uh, the, 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 the number of quality uh, tests required on the, uh, on, on the, the, the end product. Um, we've removed all the supply chain issues. Um, so actually getting a hold of animal tissue is becoming more and more difficult. Um, so we've removed that and, and effectively future proofed a, the, uh, the, 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 the product a, from a surgical perspective. Why will surgeons not use it? A, why will it not be taken up in the market? The fear of the new is always there. So, you know, their focus will be on getting uh, the key opinion leading surgeons a, to a, get involved and, and, and write papers on it. Um, and the only difference in implantation is the graft isn't as extendable. It doesn't stretch as much as the, 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 the current grafts in the market, which in the hands of a highly experienced surgeon um, makes absolutely no difference for a, a, a less experienced surgeon. We think it actually removes the potential of having too much graft material, which can lead to kinking of the graft. So it should be, we think, an easier, an easier product to implant. Um, it's not really just me saying that. Um, the, the, the professor that carried out, if we just move a slide on, please, Hannah. Um, Bart Muir is a professor. A, who carried out the uh, sheep trials a, for us um, has been very complimentary about the, the graft. Um, he has actually submitted a, a clinical paper to the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons for their annual meeting in Barcelona, which is towards the end of October this year, and his paper has been accepted. Um, so there will be visibility in the in, in, in the surgical community of this graft in, in, in advance of its launching. But Bart was you know said that the the Rua graft allows the normal surgic, a surgical replacement. It's been easy to handle and suture. It didn't bleed from the suture holes. Uh, compared to the control, a you know there is a difference in the stretching characteristics. Um, but it you know it just makes the uh, the the the, the implant a estimation of the length slightly different and actually probably slightly slightly improved so we've got you know improvement and kinking um the animal trials themselves a we were looking to prove equivalence um we can't make it as marketing claims but the the, the, the data comes out was that the graft i think has got a number of benefits over the existing technology um, out of the, um, the 15 grafts which were implanted, there was three control grafts and 12 of our own. All of the control grafts showed a, some element of a, either infection or inflammation, um, probably inflammatory response, which is the body's attempts to try and get rid of the, 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 the gelatin material. All of our 12 grafts had no indication of that infection or, uh, or inflammation. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good positive and is the kind of hook that will get people to write clinical papers on it. The other benefit that say, rests within the graft is the fact that as a, when the graft is implanted, a, the animal body or the human body, a naturally a, puts a layer, grows a layer of fibrin um, around the, uh, the, 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 the device, which is part of the healing process. Um, all of the um, the control grafts, that fibrin layer had fully attached and stuck to the graft itself. In our graft, there was a clear, what was termed as a plane of dissection. Uh, so the, the fibrin was there, but it wasn't stuck to the elastion material, um, which has got the potential of being a, you know, good news for a surgeon if he is a, ever has to go back in and reoperate on the patient. That he's not having to try and detach uh, the tissue from the device itself, that there'd be that uh, clear plane of dissection. You know, hopefully it doesn't happen very often that you know there needs to be a reoperation on a patient. But if 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 the surgeon knows that he has to have that reop, you know, it's a good reason for uh, for having the uh, having the the the, the, the Ruhr graft rather than the competing technology. Um, Everybody will no doubt be very interested as where we are in the 510k process. We just sort of move on. Thank you. Um, 
there were three main testing requirements for the 510k submission and you know, we've already announced that we have delayed a little bit the, that, that 510k application. Um, the two key testing processes are the ISO 7198 and mechanical testing. Um, our graft didn't leak as much as and had better kink resistance uh, than the control graft, so that's, that's good met all the standards without the standard requirements without any problem and you know you can at least match and improved on what the controls were um the animal trial you know was the one that if anything i was having sleepless nights over because you just don't really know what's going to happen with you know the long-term implant until you see the results at the end of it but it has come out exceptionally well the graft has been better than the control it's healed well there's been no adhesions um, in the, uh, the, the the autopsy results, there's no no thrombus. A, there's been no indication of any emboli, and a, there was no indication of any infection from the from the graft itself. A, the area that we've had an issue with is a, the biological testing or toxicology. Um, the standards changed about a year, eighteen months ago. Um, historically, all you had to show on a toxicology and biological testing was that each of the individual component parts a, were you know, biologically safe. Um, we know that the textile material that goes into, that's been used in the graft has been used there for you know, 40 odd years. Um, Elastian has been in man for 15 years and they're the only two real components that are in it. Um, but with the change in the standard, we had to undertake a uh, a, 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 a biological a suite of suite of tests. Um, what happened within that is that there was indications of a, a cellulose extract from the graft, which up until pretty much the beginning of this week we weren't a hundred percent sure where it where, where it where it come from. It was unexplained. If we had submitted our 510k to the FDA with an unknown, a, the 510k application would have been thrown out in the initial read phase, um, so it wouldn't even have got to the got to the start of the uh, examination phase. Um, so it was decided it was just wasn't 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 worth having that problem by going in with an unknown and to wait and, and until we'd conducted additional testing to uh, to get to the bottom where it came from so that we can fully explain it. Um, I think we're now 99% confident that the source of the cellulose has come from an over vigorous cleaning process that was brought in place during the early stages of COVID last year, uh, where equipment was aggressively cleaned with the uh, IPA wipes that had uh, you know, were, were, were cellulose based. Um, testing has indicated that it's, it's, it was only on the original uh, batch that went for the, uh, the biological testing that was present in, and we're currently undertaking a test in another batch uh, to see, a, to, 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 to just confirm to us that, uh, that, that that has been fully eliminated from you know, potential in the manufacturing process. I'll add that cellulose in itself is not a problem. It's just the fact that we didn't know where the cellulose came from that made it a problem. Um, so. You know, it's it's if it's come from clean room wipes that have been designed to be used in clean rooms where medical devices are manufactured, it's not in itself a problem. There is an element of contamination there, but we just need to explain where it's where it's come from. Um, so we're very, you know, now getting closer to the point of of of, of getting that five ten k submitted. I'm not going to put my neck on the line again of putting specific dates on it. But say uh, you know we are confident that uh, it won't impact on our plans for the commercialization and product launch of the uh, of, of of the device. And as I said earlier, a uh, you know one of the first that the, the the surgical market globally will hear of it is when there is a presentation on the Rio vascular grafts, a uh, which will be presented at the European Association of Cardiac Thoracic Surgeons uh, in in October of this year. Um, so that's me kind of kind of quickly going through the business. I'm sure people have got questions. I uh, am happy to you know, either try and answer them myself or pass on to Caroline or David uh, for, with any areas that uh, they're better placed to, uh, to, to, to answer that.
So thank you all for listening. And thank you for your presentation, Bill. Right. Um, so as a reminder to everyone, you can submit questions via the Q&A function, um, which should be uh, at the bottom of your, your Zoom keypad. Uh, in the meantime, we have had one submitted. Um, this was on Twitter. Uh, what do you anticipate your profit margins to be on the large bore vascular graft as you move through economies of scale? Uh, and they have put a couple of examples down here, at sort of 10,000 sales per annum and, and 50,000 sales per annum. I, know, I, I have a great deal of admiration, admiration for people asking those sorts of questions. Um, I, I hope there's some admiration for me for ducking it. Um, you know, giving out that kind of, you know, a, a lot of that is commercially sensitive. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it in detail. What I will see or how I would answer that is if anyone analyzes the, the companies that are in the market manufacturing these types of product, the gross margin that is typically achieved on those products would range from 80% to 90%. The 90% margin will be achieved by those companies who are doing all of the sales and marketing and distribution functions themselves. <coughs> and the 80% will be those who are putting products through a distribution route. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, we, we are not going to incur the costs and the risk of setting up our own sales teams. We're looking to use a, you know, established companies that are, you know, fully recognized by all the key opinion leading surgeons in their territories to distribute the product. So, you know, we're not going to achieve 90%, but if we're on target, you know, I would be, I, I, I would be disappointed if the vascular range wasn't able to achieve a similar gross margin that the rest of the business is currently able to manage. For a man who wasn't going to answer the question, I think you very, did that very deftly, Bill. So well done. Um, uh, another one here. In, in the most recent RNS, uh, you stated that the heart valve project testing has been brought in house. Um, this gentleman uh, is concerned this might be a risk to quality um, because you would be essentially marking your own homework. Are you confident that this is the right approach to successfully get to market? A, the equipment that we are bringing in house is the equipment that's used by most of the world's largest medical device companies. Um, the manufacturer of that equipment sits on the standard writing committee as to how the uh, testing of valves and in, in particular, and the, the, the do graphs as well should be undertaken. Um, so as long as as long as we are doing the regulatory testing to the protocols that are required, um, you know, there's no difference in us doing it or somebody else doing it because it's a paper read exercise. Um, the, 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 there are two types of testing, however. So there's the, the, the regulatory testing, which is where when you've got the design freeze and you say, this is the valve that I hope to take to market. Does it meet the ISO standards in durability? Um, does it meet the ISO standards in a, the hydrodynamic profile? You undertake that test. But in the run up to getting to design freeze, you need to know how your valve's working. And you know, if, if you've got to book time in a testing lab, write a detailed protocol with that testing lab, enable that testing lab to, to, to do the test, and then feed back to you, you know, a paper presentation on how your valve performed. You know, your, your, your feedback loop between design iterations becomes elongated and, you know, I think commercially, that potentially commercially damages the project. So being able to have a go at a valve, make a valve, stick it on our own testing equipment. Does it work? Yes, no. Do we need to change it? Try it again. 
you know, turns a much, much longer process into, in, into a shorter process. And, you know, any company that is developing heart valves would have this type of equipment in-house to undertake the testing. Perhaps on a more positive note then, um, the target market for the graphs initially is the US. Yep. Uh, does Rua anticipate manufacturing capacity as it stands today to be taken up by that market? Or do you think you have sufficient to expand um, into the EU, uh, Europe and rest of the world markets? The manufacturing capacity which will be in place, it, it, it will be in place for launch. All of it won't necessarily be validated at launch, you know, because the, the, there will be a ramp up in, in the level of sales that won't all just start on day one. Um, we believe that on a single shift basis, the capacity a, of the equipment that's been put in place when, you know, fully validated, not running properly, is about 900 graphs a month. So that's 11,000 a year. Uh, on a double shift basis, you can take that up to sort of close to 20,000. 20, um, the global market is 200,000 grafts. The US market is a, about 90,000 grafts. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've got the capacity there to take a, you know, pretty useful market share. Um, and we can increase that capacity relatively quickly by replicating the same line of equipment in a second a clean room a, to be built for dedicated to the grafts. So it's, it's, we will have enough to have a really, really exciting business, you know, subject to being able to, you know, get enough customers for them. Um, but we won't have the, 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 the potential capacity constraints of not being able to meet that. So we've been, we've been planning, planning that in the process. Don't know, David or Caroline, would you add any more to that? Yeah, I mean, um, certainly, uh, as you mentioned earlier in the presentation, Bill, is, is having that capacity in place, uh, looking forward rather than reacting to sales. Uh, so we're, we're, we're investing in that capacity space by, uh, as you mentioned, Bill, buying the building uh, next door to number two, number three, to, to, to move that forward. So we are ready to react to that. But, um, you know, with capacity, we're also building, uh, there's a pipeline of products in behind uh, the graph, there's the, the patch there. Uh, and then we'll be using the, the technologies that we've developed in the, the last uh, uh, through lockdown and, uh, and uh, the R&D team will be moving on to these. So uh, we will be adding products to the pipeline. So capacity, we'll, we'll be putting that in place for, uh, for these products coming through as well as once they're approved. Good. Well, thank you. At the moment, we don't have any more questions. Clearly, they've uh, decided to give you an easy run this afternoon. Uh, if anyone does have one, now's the moment. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you for an extremely helpful update. Um, I think we might, I hope, hear from you again in six months' time. And in the meantime, very best of luck with the 510k submission. Thank you very much, Anna. Good. All right. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Anna. Bye.